And with that, I'll let uh, John Gray, who's uh, been the architect of our bug series this winter, tell a little bit about tonight's speaker. Appreciate it. Friends, we are among greatness. <laughs> our speaker tonight is a legend in the world of fly fishing, not just regionally, but internationally. He comes from a family whose history is intertwined with fly fishing in the Appalachians. In fact, he's a member of the board of directors of the Fly Fishing Museum of the Southern Appalachians in Cherokee. He's well educated. He holds two bachelor's degrees as well as a master's in engineering. They're not giving those out to just anybody. He's the author of countless articles and he's the author of the book, The 50 Best Places to Fly Fish in the Southeast. Pretty good stuff. He's a renowned fly tire. He's a signature designer for Umqua Feather Merchants. And he's the inventor of many fly patterns that have become go-to flies for fishermen, including one of my favorites, Kevin's Stonefly. He's the owner of Davidson River Outfitters, which is a fantastic fly shop and outfitting service on the banks of the Davidson River in Pisgah Forest, North Carolina, near Brevard. It really is one of the best fly shops in the country, and it's staffed with lots and lots of capable guides and lots and lots of world-class characters. So if you haven't had a chance to visit there, you really should go and visit. He's also a managing director of Andes Drifters, which is a company that manages several exclusive trout and dorado fly fishing lodges in Patagonia. He is an incredible fly fisherman. He is a Fly Fishing Federation certified casting instructor, just like our own Derman Sox. And he's also a past winner of the Fly Fishing Masters. This was a season long elimination fly fishing tournament that was shown on the Outdoor Life Network. In fact, it was so successful and entertaining, it was on for a number of seasons in a row. Some of the best fly fishermen from around the country were invited to participate in the tournament. Each week they were taken to new waters all across the United States, some of which they'd never even seen before. They were given flies to fish that week or asked to tie their own flies. Then they were turned loose on the water to see who was the best angler. To have won that tournament, I can tell you, really speaks volumes about his skill and expertise. We're so lucky to have him with us here tonight. I've heard him speak many times, and I'm sure you're gonna enjoy his presentation. Please help me welcome Kevin Howell. Thanks, John. I didn't know the $100 I gave you to get back to <laughs> <laughs> see it, I think okay, this is kind of the darkest slide. Um, my buddy Sonny Green scared me to death a minute ago because he asked me if I was presenting mayflies and I said, uh, no, caddis flies, I think. <laughs> so I want to do a presentation on caddis flies. John called and asked me to do this. He said there's a lot of new members. So the more I thought about it, I thought, well, if you're a new member, I want to keep this simple and easy to understand, I hope. Don't want to get into all the Latin terms. My father's one of the best fly fishermen I ever knew. And my grandfather, and they couldn't have told you the Latin name of a single insect in the river. They could have told you that you needed a yellow K Hill size 14 to fish, but they couldn't have told you what the insect was. They didn't care to tell you what the insect was. They just cared they knew they had what they needed in their box. Uh, so John introduced me there, so we'll kind of skip over the introductions and get right into the, the caddis flies. Caddis flies are probably the single most important insect in the trout stream. We know that there's over 7,000 species of caddis flies around the world, from clingers to free swimmers. There's all different kinds of subgroups. And the really important thing here is that they're available as a food source to trout as pupa, larva, and as an adult. 
So a stonefly typically crawls out of the river and flies off, and once he gets blown back in, he's not really available as an adult. So that's why the, there's more stonefly nymphs than there are stonefly dries. But the caddis, they're available in several different uh, life cycles. So most of you have probably seen them on the river. The adults have tent-shaped wings that lay back over their body. Um, they range from 1.5 millimeters, which is T-tiny, our little winter micro caddis are usually black or uh, really deep gray or brown or something, all the way up to 15 millimeters for your larger October caddis, which you'll find in the fall of the year. A lot of times out west, we don't have spruce, spruce moths here, per se, that I've seen. Have you ever seen any around here, Don? I, I haven't ever seen out west, a lot of times people will tell me, oh yeah, there was a good caddis hatch and it's actually a spruce moth because a caddis and a spruce, spruce moth look very similar to each other when they're flying around in the air. And the colors of the caddis body typically follow the season. So in the wintertime, early spring, things are dark and gray. You're going to have your gray caddis, your browns, your speckled. You may also hear, also hear them called sedges. As you get on into spring, you get tans and yellows, brighter colors in the fall. When the leaves turn, you'll get your October caddis, which are orange or ginger colored. So general rule of thumb is that your color of the caddis body is going to follow nature. They want to blend in a little bit, so to speak. So the life cycle of a caddis takes about a whole year, roughly, to evolved for most species. The female will return to the water, lay the eggs in a little gel sac, they go to the bottom, it becomes a larva. Some of those larvae cling to the rocks, some of them are free floaters, some of them are swimmers, stick burrowers, they make nests. But the caddis larvae get very, very active on the bottom of the stream right before they go into the pupa stage and that's what makes check nymphing, if you've ever seen check nymphing or if you are a check nymphing person, that's what makes that such an effective pre uh, presentation is most of those check nymphs are some form of a caddis larva. So he leaves the larva stage, <clears throat> he builds this little cocoon, he's in that for a little short period of time and then he forms an air bubble underneath his exoskeleton and he rides that air bubble to the top as the pupa. And when he's going to the top, he doesn't slowly go to the top. He goes to the top very rapidly, hits the surface of the water and flies off. How many of you have seen trout jumping out of the river at caddis flies? Okay, they're usually about this long, all right? <laughs> because the old big guy, he's smarter and wiser. He's getting them down underneath before they get up there to the top and get airborne. So they go, once they hit the top of the water, they skate along, fly off. They live anywhere from 24 to hours to maybe a week, depending on the exact species. And then the whole life cycle starts over again. They never feed as an adult. Okay, when they hatch out, they fly off, their whole thing is about breeding, coming back, and laying eggs. They never feed once they become an adult. Now, when you get in a really heavy caddis hatch, there's some weird things that can happen. Okay, and your buddy gets to swing the fly just a little too hard and gets you right in the ear. So, I always put that in for a little humor, but uh, it, it was funny to me, but it wasn't really funny to him. Uh, this guy is actually a, a renowned surgeon who was on a trip with me to Argentina, and they ran me down on the river, and he said, you got to get the fly out of my ear. So. I said, yeah, but I've never seen that before because it literally went through this flap, through the little middle part, and then pinned up into the top like that. So, um, good hook set. Yeah, it's a good hook set. <laughs> All in one motion. <laughs> so our caddis larva are generally going to look something like this, and we're going to talk about colors in a minute. Um, like I said, they get super active on the floor of the stream, and you can see they've got a little fuzzy almost like hairy uh, body. You can see all the little uh, 
hair coming off of them. And so here's our check nymphs. So all of our caddis larvae, our rock worms, our stick bait, they need to be weighted heavy. That's where those larvae live. They live down on the bottom of the, the river. They're not up swimming around in the middle of the current. So you want to get your caddis larva imitations down deep and keep them there. <coughs> Most of the larvae in our part of the country are bright green. You'll hear them called rock worms. Or they have a cream color. You'll hear it called stick bait a lot of times. Or they're some type of a ginger or pink hue to them. Those don't really have names that I know of. But the stick bait, which is the big like October caddis, um, you'll have those in the fall. But they're very large nymphs and you know, ginger color or a cream color. So I thought about our caddis pupa. And here's a good representation of a fly we're going to use for that. This is Gary Lafontaine's sparkle pupa. And what I'm looking for when I'm picking a fly for a caddis pupa is I'm going to pick something that's going to trap air. I want it to have that natural looking sack to it, that air filled sack and the bubbles in there to help it get to the surface. Our caddis pupa, we don't want to get all the way to the bottom. We want them to be in that middle of the water column or just under the surface. That's where those fish are looking for that as it comes up. So our caddis duns, this is an October caddis. You can see the ginger color here. This is what's available. They're available to trout either as a spinner, which means they're done. They've died, they've fallen in the water. They're laying eggs on the water, the female comes back to drop the eggs. Or like I said, a lot of times you'll see the little bitty trout jumping at the ones as they're hatching off and trying to buzz out of the, out of the water. And skating flies started by trying to match that cat of skating on top of the water. And we're going to talk about skating a fly here in just a second. So for our drives, being a fly shop owner, everybody comes in my shop and they say, I want an elk hair caddis. It's a great fly. I'm not taking anything away from it. However, there are better caddis patterns for different scenarios on the water. An elk hair caddis tied by Al Trough was originally designed to be a skating fly. Okay, I got to meet Al one time and talk to him, and he designed that fly to skate and make it dance and shoot across the water. It works really good in our part of the country with the turbulent water. It floats really well. It can be easily seen. But you should really pick your dry fly based on how fast is the water moving? What are the caddis flies doing? Are they laying eggs? Are they dying off? What, what stage of the life cycle are they in? So now I'm going to go through some caddis flies and I'm going to talk to you about the differences of them. This is an X caddis. Uh, Craig Matthews, Blue Ribbon Flies, came up with this fly. Typically a size 12 to an 18, and it's great for slow water conditions. In other words, there's nothing on the bottom of this fly. It's going to sit trapped in the film. It's going to look like it's either stuck in its shuck with the tail hanging out here, the tailing chuck, it looks like it's stuck there and it can't get out of the water surface. It means it's very vulnerable to the trout. But if you go throw this in the Davison River in a plunge pool, the turbulent water is probably just going to suck it right on down and you're not going to see it. Doesn't mean they won't eat it, it just means you're not going to have as much time to watch it. So then we have another surface fly here, Ferminsky's fluttering caddis. And this guy's got a foam body, a little tuft of antron, and then an elk hair wing, kind of like an elk hair caddis. But notice he is missing the hackle. This guy sets, again, low in the film. So if you're fishing out here at Saluda Shoals and it's a long, flat slick, and you've got some caddis coming off, this is a great guy to, to put on there. He's going to look more natural in the water like he's trapped. It'll work well in that slow to mid-current situation. 
The other thing about this guy being foam is it's a great fly if you want to add a caddis pupa or some type of dropper off the back of it. It will float very, very well. Our good friend, the elk hair caddis, we've all got a box full of them. The good thing about the elk hair is if you can name a caddis color, it's tied in an elk hair caddis. Okay, some of the others, like the X caddis, they're either going to be tan or olive. Um, Frominsky's caddis, yellow, black, tan. Um, but the elk hair comes in a plethora of colors. And like I said, it was designed for skating or dancing on the water to elicit a strike that way. This is one of my flies, a clip caddis. And notice if we went back to that tent wing and we pulled that tent wing up on that fly, he's still got that fuzzy little body that we saw on the larvae. So I duplicated that here. And I used a um, medium barred ginger hackle. So you see I've got black and ginger in that hackle. It's not just a one color uh, hackle. And he's designed to set not totally on the water, but set lower than an elk hair caddis, but be able to be fished in rougher water. For our caddis pupa, I've got a couple flies here that I suggest. This is a LaFontaine's Sparkle Pupa. Size 10 to 16. I like to fish it in the film as an emerger. If I'm not fishing it as an emerger, I will fish it with a brass bead to get it down just a little bit, but I don't want this guy on the bottom per se. Um, I want him down in the film somewhere. Here's another one. This is a like an ice caddis. And there's thousands of these. Uh, caddis pupa patterns, if you get online, I mean, I can sit here all night and talk about caddis fly limitations. But you'll notice I've got three different tied flies here. One barely has a little bit of fuzz to it. I'm going to treat that the middle and the right. I'm going to treat that more like a larva than I'm going to treat it like a pupa. And then you notice that I have one that's a fuzzed out a little more. And then the one at the top is fuzzed out a lot. The more you fuzz it out, the more air it traps, the more natural it looks in that pupa state to them. So that's all I'm trying to do with the, the um, by picking my dubbing out. And all I did is dubbing, and that's just clear uh, V rib or D rib or any type of clear ribbing over it, and then pick the dubbing out of it. For our larva, we have our good friend, the rockworm. You can find this guy tied in cream, ginger, pink. I mean, you name it, there's a thousand different colors of it. This guy works really, really good. And all the time I hear people come into my shop in the wintertime and go, man, I caught him on a green inchworm size 14 today. And it's December. Why are they eating green inchworms? Well, they're not really eating the inchworm thinking it's an inchworm. They're eating the green inchworm thinking that it's a caddis larva that's down there that time of year. So, here's a tan UV check nymph. These guys are weighted super heavy. This one has a bead on it. You can also get them to have the whole shank with basically poured tungsten around it. That will, I mean, they'll get right to the bottom and stay there. So uh, you're looking for something that's going to get deep and stay there. I like this color the best for me on check nymphing, and I don't do a lot of check nymphing, but I do do some, but this is my favorite fly for the check nymphing method for our part of the country. How many people have a Copper John in there? There's a lot of controversy whether it's a stone fly or whether it's a caddis fly or whether it's a mayfly. The fact of the matter is, if we pulled out some caddis larva, we could very easily say that it's a caddis nymph. We could also pull out some stonefly larva and very easily say that it's a stonefly nymph and lay them up here beside each other. So, to me, anytime I've got a fly that represents 
maybe two or three possible food groups to a fish, that's a killer fly because it doesn't really matter what's hatching, I'm going to be matching it. The other thing about the copper john that a lot of people don't realize is that you've got a whole body of copper wire, you've got a big old bead on the front of it and the weight of the hook, that sucker goes to the bottom and it stays there. So, so often I see a lot of anglers fish over top of their fish, they never get their fly down to where the fish is at. So, this guy works great, he's super effective and that's why as he gets to the bottom and stays there. So how do we skate a fly? You've heard me mention skating it several times and I hope I can explain this correctly without having moving water in a fly rod here. So we've all been taught to throw upstream or quartering upstream. I'm actually going to throw straight across the stream. Okay? I'm going to make my cast straight across. My fly's going to land. I'm going to let it begin its drift. It's going to go you know, 6, 8, 10, 12 inches a foot, 2 foot, or however far I want it to go. Then, with my line tight, my rod down here, I'm going to slowly lift it up. And that fly will dance and walk right on top of the water. Once it goes about two feet, I stop. You lower your rod tip and you let it drift back a little bit. You lift it up again so the whole time it looks like that fly is going forward and getting knocked back. So that's the, the what you want. I see a lot of people that start hearing do this whoosh, with their rod and when they just move that fly eight feet. The trout isn't going to chase it eight feet. But you want to move it a foot, foot and a half, let it float back, move it a foot, foot and a half. My grandfather was exceptional at this technique. Um, and you can see that you can walk it all the way across the river, and by the time it gets back to you, you're downstream of yourself. This is the trick to this is you have to use a nice, smooth, tapered leader. You can't fish a knotted leader, you can't fish feral lead or anything because if you do it picks up on the surface tension and it drags and it doesn't want to skate as much or you pick up any debris that's in there with you and you pull it along and the fish realizes well not only is the fly moving but the leaf's moving and the stick's moving and everything else so if you want to pick it up where it just gently slides keep your leader well greased well um, dressed so it'll slide right on the surface. And execute this by using your rod tip and not by trying to strip line. I'm basically going to keep a static line and I'm just using my rod to, to work it down the stream. This is also super effective for fishing wet flies. And I'm sure Don probably, you talk about stone flies, who did make flies? You probably talked about how effective a wet fly was during that. Wet flies are super effective for, for a caddis hatch and again I can use that method of skating or pulling the fly with the wet fly as it comes across and sometimes I may only move it six inches and that's enough. Sometimes I move it a foot but it does create a very very violent strike. So if you're fishing downstream with 6x, 7x tippet and a big 18 inch fish comes and is a, has a very violent strike. If you're not prepared to let him have a little line before you set the hook, you will break your line every time, guaranteed. The other thing I'll say about a wet fly, and John told me there's a lot of people who are just getting started in here, this is the single most effective fly you can have in your box. I don't care what you're imitating. That I've won more money, more tournaments, caught more fish on the wet fly than any other fly in my box. Oh. So, that was a real quick overview of caddis flies, and we're talking some more about presentation here. But if you want a reference for caddis flies, there's a book called Caddis Flies written by Gary LaFontaine, 1981. It's about 325 pages that will tell you more than you have ever dreamed of wanting to know about caddis flies. <laughs> so, Gary LaFontaine, 
when he passed away, probably knew more about caddis flies than anybody in the world. He devoted his whole life to studying them and was a master at trout fishing because of that. So let's talk about presentation a little bit. I always get questions of, what's the one thing you can tell me I can do better at the end of the guide trip? They say, what, what's the one thing that you tell me to always know? If I could record it and play it in people's ear on a guide trip, it, I'd just be standing there going, mend, 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 mend again, mend upstream, mend downstream. Line management and mending and making that fly float naturally on the water is the key to success. The other thing that I tell people is make your first cast count. Okay, I, I do casting presentations. I just got back from the Atlanta Fly Fishing Show. Anybody at the Atlanta Fly Fishing Show this year? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So one of my big things in the fly fishing show that I talk about when I do a casting presentation is that the more times you make a false cast to a fish, the more chance you have of hanging your fly behind you, hanging your fly above you, getting out of rhythm, ticking the water surface, you name it. There's a thousand things that can go wrong with your cast. And I don't care how good of a caster you are, you can mess it up. So especially when there's a nice rising trout, you know, I've seen people that were great casters and as soon as there's a 24 inch fish rising out in front of them, you know, it's just like my first time when I was standing on a boat and a 200 pound tarpon came swimming at me. I blew it, you know, it's going to happen to all of us. So practice in your backyard a little bit, learn to limit your back cast, one back, one false cast and put it back in the water. Go fishing. And I see this one a ton, and it drives me crazy as people are fishing on the river. They get hung up, they wade out into the middle of the river, they get their fly and hung, they walk right back to where they were and turn around and start fishing right where they were hung up. Well, you just kicked your trout in the head with a size 11 boot. So. It, it seems simple now, but I see it a ton. Um, and then keep in mind, if you're fishing wild trout, small little streams, uh, William Glass Creek, Davison River, um, anywhere where the fish are wild and native, they don't pot up like hatchery fish. Those hatchery fish grew up together. They lived in a community setting. That's where they want to live. Those wild fish, they spread out. You gotta buy your real estate by the mile. So, you know, if I'm fishing in the East Fork or a delayed harvest stream where it's heavily stocked, I may only fish quarter, half mile in a half day. If I'm fishing wild trout on the East Fork of the Pigeon River, I may cover four miles in a day. So keep that in mind as what you're covering. So the other question I get is, well, where do I find fish and how do I find fish? So if we look at this picture, the first ones I'm going to point out are these two. Everybody notice what's up with them? They're facing the wrong way in the river, right? So the eddy comes in and the trout always looks into the current. So because that's a back eddy, he's looking the wrong way. So when you come walking up here, la -di -da -di -da, these guys don't see you, but these guys are looking straight at you. So keep that in mind when you're fishing eddies and stuff, is how do you approach them where you're not going to spook those fish that are looking at you. I left my laser pointer out in the truck, but if I had it, I'd use it right now. So I'll try and walk you through this. If I'm going to come up this river and I'm going to fish this, most of us are right-handed, which means most of us are going to come up the left-hand side of this river as far as we can. So as I come up through here, I'm going to catch the fish that is closest to me first. Okay, so as I come up, 
I'm going to fish with this guy, I'm going to come on up, then I'm going to fish with this guy, then this guy, then this guy. And the reason for that is when you spook this guy and he darts and runs, trout have what I call the domino effect. Bob runs, he scares George, now Bob and George run, they get Ralph and Ralph, Bob and George have all gone up underneath the rock. And you never saw a fish in the pool going, there's no fish in this river. Um, so if you can pick them off one at a time, take your time. When I get up here to these guys, what am I going to do? Well, I'm coming up there here, probably going to try and catch these two from back here. But I'm probably going to have to either cross the river here or go around this. Eddies are typically pretty deep for the most part. So I'm going to try and get myself either lower or in a position where I think those fish can't see me to catch them. And then as I come on up, I'm going to work each fish that's closest to me and the one that's furthest away. Does that make sense? Another thing I see is keep your fly line and your leader well greased and floating. It goes back to the mending. I see people struggling to mend and they can't get their line to come out of the water. If you clean your line and your leader and you dress it with mucilin or uh, I think Rio's Agent X, I mean there's a multitude of, of line cleaners out there. If you clean it and grease your leader, it will float right on top. You can also use mucilin which is what I use. The problem with mucilin is if you use it over and over and over and over without cleaning your fly line, it will build up a heavy film on your fly line and stuff over time, make it heavier. Um, but a well-greased leader and line that floats on top, when you go to mend it, you barely have to move your hand to mend that line instead of trying to muscle lines under the surface of the water out. <coughs> It also makes for more efficient hook sets because your line is on top of the water and again you're not trying to pull it up through the water column to get it tight. <coughs> I always hear, well man they ate 7x today better than they ate 6x. I got news for you, if a trout can pick out a size 30 or 26 midge floating through a riffle, he can see any tippet you've got. Hate to be the bearer of bad news. What happens is, as we go smaller and smaller and smaller in tip, and it's not necessarily that the trout is not seeing it, it's that it's giving you a more natural drift because it's thinner and more supple. So as you go into smaller and smaller tippets, you get a more natural drift in presentation. Also, when we have high water like we do now, I'm not going to go out here in the saloon and fish 6x, but the thinner the thinnest diameter you can get away with will allow your nymphs to sink quicker through the water current. So keep that in mind. Approaching fish. Um, this is probably the suggestion I'd say of not, how not to approach a fish. Um, there's several scenarios with this picture that's a problem. Um, luckily, I told Sam to go stand in the middle of the water, and he didn't know I was going to do this and use him as a pitcher, but he, he wasn't doing this on purpose. So, one, he's waiting right up the middle of the river, literally right up the middle of the river. So, he's kicking trout on the head, he's running them everywhere, scaring them. The other thing that he's doing, if you'll notice, see all those waves he's generating? As those waves roll through the pool, those trout sense that movement and that motion and they realize something's not right. And my father used to fuss at me if I ran away through a pool, I'd hear it for the rest of the fishing trip. How I was waiting like Daniel Boone's mule and horses didn't make that much noise in the water. And you name it, I heard it. <clears throat> so he beat it into my head that stealth mattered. And as I spent 26 years in the guiding industry, I can wholeheartedly tell you that stealth matters. Not that you have to get down and crawl, but don't be running waves and clanking rocks and kicking stuff and making that kind of noise with your feet. 
So learning where and how to wade, and this is my favorite saying right here, sloppy wading is save more fish than any regulation written by man. Okay, guaranteed. So how's the best way to walk in a stream? Like a herring. Pick one foot up, I put the ball of my foot down and I roll into my step. Now, if you come up there scuffing your feet or kicking, if you've ever been in a pool and heard people clank rocks together, those fish can hear that clanking noise forever. I still to this day swear they hear cleats. Um, I end up wearing cleats sometimes because I have to. Don and I fished in New York and if you didn't wear cleats up there, you were swimming. <laughs> But um, there are places where you have to wear cleats, but I still swear they can hear the cleats and that makes a difference sometimes. Avoid running waves to fish in flat water and stay out of the water as much as possible. And even to emphasize this lower one, one year we had a really wet year like this. Walker Parrott, who's my shop manager, and I were fishing the Harmon's Invitational Tournament in West Virginia. The North Fork of the South Branch of the Potomac River, it takes me a long time to put all that together. Um, normally about 250 CFS, when we got there it was 10,000 CFS. They postponed the tournament one day, the next day we went fishing, it was at like 1,000 CFS. So the rule was that only one person could fish at a time and that the partner had to help stabilize the other person in the water. Okay, that tells you how high it was. Walker Parrott and I won that tournament with about a 24 inch advantage over our closest competitors and we fished in flip flops and never stepped in the river. Okay, we walked the edge of the river we found the eddies where the trout had backed out to. We stood on the bank and caught the fish out of the eddies. So you don't have to wade waist deep to catch the fish. That's the point of my story is that you can catch them standing on the bank. But the advantages of wading out deeper, choose the path less taken. So this is our guide Landon Lipke here. This is up on Courthouse Creek. There's a nice path on the right side of the river. And that's the way everybody goes up through there. And I've watched this over years being a guide. I used to have a pool on the Davison that, the upper Davison, it had a trail on the right side of it. And that's where everybody went. You can't go on the left side of it because of a big rock. And we'd get up there to that pool. I knew there were fish in that pool. We'd fish it, we'd catch one, we'd catch two. I knew there had to be more fish in that pool. So finally it got to the point where I would climb a little tree there is leaning out like that. I'd get up in that tree so I could watch that pool of water. And I'd have my angler come up from behind the pool, just like we all would, on the right side where he had to go. And as he got up there, every fish in that pool moved to the left side of the pool. So next time I came up to there, I got up in the tree and I set my angler up the left side. I said, okay, I'm going to call the fish out. You go up the left side. We'll see what happens. And as he went up the left side, those fish stayed right where they were. They didn't see him as a threat. They didn't see him as a problem. Caught five or six fish out of the pool. Most fish I'd ever caught out of the pool. Yes, we had to turn around and walk and come back around the pool because you can't physically go around the left side of it. But sometimes, if it looks really easy, everybody's there doing easy. So, making it a little more difficult um, can be that. Also, avoiding wading and casting in the same places that everybody else does. If you look over there and you see that that's Big Sammy's home and you know that Big, big Mossy Back Sammy lives underneath the bank, I guarantee you that every one of us are going to walk up to there and go, yep, Big Sammy Mossy Bike lives underneath that bank. Am I going to throw to it? Yes, but I'm going to fish my way to it. And where I'm saying 
avoid caching where everybody else does is everybody else walks up there and sees it and they throw it straight to Big Sammy. So fish to Big Sammy. Don't walk up there and throw right to it. This is a, a statement I picked up from a, a good client who used to go to Argentina with me. Um, and the more I thought about it, it, it just applies to fishing in general. So we're sitting there and we're talking about going. His buddy's like, I don't know, 72 hours of travel time. And Jim looks at him and he goes, if it was easy, everybody would be in Argentina. So, and that's the truth. If it's easy to get there, everybody's going to be there. The other thing is faster water will cover your mistakes. A lot of people say, why not catch more out of the fast water than the still water? The fast water covers your mistakes. And it forces that fish to make a decision. He can't scrutinize your fly. He has to either eat it or let it go. So don't be afraid to fish the faster water. The bigger fish are sometimes in the faster water as well as in the pools. So John told me to tell you a little bit about myself too, as a shop, what we do. So we have, this is just a picture from the inside of the shop. We have a full range of fly tiring stuff, rod building, rods, reels, lines, all that. Um, between Walker, Parrot, Joe Paul, and myself, we've pretty much caught everything from brook trout to bluefin tuna on a fly rod. So we can set you up, rig you out, be sure you got the right gear when you get there. Um, we do guide over all of Western North Carolina. Uh, we have one of the few permits for the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. Um, we guide trout, smallmouth. We do guide musky in the wintertime. I will tell you, musky is seasonal late September through to end of February, 1st of March. After that, don't worry about the musky in our part of the country. And we'll float or um, wade fish. And then we also fish some area lakes for uh, smallmouth and largemouth bass. We do a full line of classes, and these will be on our website. We do rod building, fly tying, fly fishing classes. Not only do we do introductory, intermediate, and then like full on two and three day schools, but we also do a lot of, we call them mini schools, starting in about March or April. We'll run them all through the spring and summer and early fall. Maybe it's nymph fishing 101, streamer fishing, um, improving your dry fly casting, you name it, we'll do all that kind of stuff. Um, as a mini school, four hours, and we do it on the river right behind our shop. So it's not a classroom thing. We take you out there and put you in the river and say this is, this is what you're looking for, this is how you need to do it. We also do some specialty classes, um, spay fishing. Jeff Hall, one of our um, guys, ran Alaska West for nine years. And if you want to know anything about spay fishing, Jeff can tell it to you. And we also have a custom built rod program if you need Christmas present or birthday present or something for your buddy. Um, and then I'll call it quits with that, and I'm around to take questions, and I'm here to answer them, so feel free to ask away. Give us a quick rundown on Argentina. Quick rundown on Argentina, that's where this picture is from. Right. <laughs> so Argentina has a very definite season for the trout. Season opens November 1st, season ends May 31st. December, January, February, and March are by far the best months for Patagonia. When you get into April, the fishing is great, but you can get snow in April in Patagonia. You can get snow in March in Patagonia. I've been there, done that. But um, you can fish dry flies from December, January, February, and March. All great dry fly fishing, streamer fishing. We do a couple of different options. You can fish the San Martin area. We, we have taken over a lodge called Spring Creek Lodge. Um, we house all of our guests there that we run that lodge now. 
and fish out of there. And you can do day trips that are float trips or wade fishing. We also do overnight float trips on the river where you float sections of the river you can't get to unless you float for two or three days to go through there. And my favorite thing over the past five years is I fish all the lakes. I could care less about the rivers. Um, and you say that's crazy going to Argentina and caring less about the rivers. But in the lakes, you stand on the front of the boat, you get your big size 8 chubby Chernobyl or whatever foam dry fly you like, and you sight fish to 22 to 30 inch trout that are cruising the foam lines on the lake. So it's just like red fishing or um, bone fishing, but it's all trout. And if you lead him, he'll take your dry fly just about every time. So uh, We also do we have taken over Casa de Capa, which is up north in the Illumina area, and we fish all the small spring creeks. If you like spring creek fishing, little bitty tiny wading streams. Um, the biggest stream up there is from me to the wall wide. Um, most of them are half that. Uh, but you have to be ready to walk up there. Uh, in the spring creeks, you're going to walk up there, you're going to fish one pool, you're going to catch a big fish, look a big fish, lose a big fish. Got to walk to the next pool. So a lot of walking on the on the spring creeks, and then we do Golden Dorado in the Iberia Marsh, which is an unbelievable place. I can't really describe it. It's uh, Bluffton, Hilton Head area on steroids as far as the marsh goes. It's just a huge wetland um, sanctuary, all little interbraided streams and creeks and canals with the Golden Dorado in it. And then we fish the Rio Paraná for the large 50-pound Golden Dorado and the Pacu and Pirapita, which are the other subspecies. Um, you've seen the Pacu, looks like the big bluegill um, on steroids with human teeth. So, yeah. And the, the Dorado fishing is in the jungle. Um, that is northern Argentina. You can fish in September, October are really nice and comfortable months. Then the season closes for spawning for November and December. The season is closed. It opens back up January 1st. And January in the marsh or January in Itati, you can count on about 115 degrees every day. Um, it will literally fry you. Um, the fishing is fabulous, but you've got to be ready for it. So I like September, October. I like February, March, April uh, for that. July is just too blooming hot for me. I'm a mountain boy. <laughs> I mean, y'all are from Columbia. It's hot down here, so you may be fine. A <laughs> well, wonderful thing in Argentina is there's just nobody there. Yeah. You're not going to see anybody outside of your own party. Yeah, there's a... Uh, last year there were... Uh, let me get this straight. 785,000 fishing licenses sold in the country of Argentina which is the eighth largest country in the world. There was right at 11 million fishing licenses sold in the state of North Carolina. If that puts it in perspective. <laughs> How do you get there? Uh, the best way, you can either go through Atlanta or through uh, uh, Miami. Uh, either, either way, you're, gonna, you're going through one of those two places to go to Argentina. I like Atlanta. You fly Atlanta to Buenos Aires. <laughs> And then Buenos Aires, you now have a plane. If you're going to Patagonia, you can stay in the same airport, catch the plane, and go on over. Um, if your plane gets in late or something, you have to transfer to the domestic airport and take a flight from there. But it's not that big of a, a transfer. But I do like it now that we do have one flight from the, the international airport over to Patagonia. So. And then they'll pick you up the airport from there on. You're, you're in their hands. And I guarantee you, you will not come back craving steak. You will not eat steak in the United States for about two months because it's not nearly as good as what you ate down there. And uh, the wine is uh, second to none. So, so yes, sir. Kevin, can you say some more about your wet fly techniques? So wet fly techniques, I fish wet flies several different ways. Um, a lot of times, even with um, nymphs, like if I'm nymph fishing, I will put a wet fly behind a large nymph. Um, it does two things. 
one, it's a smaller little morsel bite there. Every time the current hits those soft tackles, it moves it. Um, the other thing is, we all have a tendency to do it when you mend, you, you scoot your fly, and it makes that soft tackle look like he's trying to dart away or emerge. Also, if you get it downstream of you and you go to swing it to pick it up, it looks like it's swinging out, causalizing or lift. Um, so that's why they're so effective. There's really no wrong way to fish them. Um, I don't fish them downstream. A lot of the old time guys fished them, walk downstream and threw them downstream. I don't tend to walk downstream and fish them. I do tend to let them drift out below me and swing them up, but I don't tend to walk downstream per se and fish them just that way. So, but number one, put them behind a, a um, nymph with a little BB or some type of shot behind it. Number two way, I barely get him wet and I'm fishing behind a dry fly where he's trapped in the film, like he's setting, you know, stuck there, can't go anywhere. Um, number three way, um, like I said, I'll, I'll take him on that nymph rig and swing him and make him try and fish eating that way. That help you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. What do you think about the shake hooks? Absolutely love them. Um, I absolutely love them. They don't dull your hook hitting the rocks. I found with um, the fishing I've done with them, I get a better hook and hold ratio than with a J hook. Um, I don't know if it varies in at a different angle or what, but it does seem to hold in their mouth better. I don't have as many pull outs and pull offs. Um, as I did with, with the regular J-hook. Is your set different? Uh, no, my set's the same. Yeah. And it also gives your fly a, uh, a rise and fall motion, which any predatory fish, when they see an object come up and then fall like it's wounded back down, they, they really tend to, to like that. Who else? Yes, Question about your... Um, Presentation and stealth, etc. Obviously, sure. the the waiting, um, as you want to be quiet. But for somebody who's six seven, mm -hmm. what about visually the, the fish seeing us as fishermen more? Am I better off kneeling in shallow water? You know, two thirds of the fly fishing community are going to say yes. You're better off kneeling. I'm going to tell you if you're wearing an earth toned shirt and you're behind the fish. In theory, it shouldn't matter. So um, the only time I would be cautious of it is when we went back to that eddy, those fish that are laying the, the opposite ways where I'd be cautious of, of being too tall um, or, or, you know, having too much of a presence. Or if you, the sun's at your back and throwing a big shadow. Um, that's the other time I'd be cautious of it. But to walk up the hole and just get on my knees and try and fish it, I don't. I haven't done that since I was that big, and I, I don't do it now. So, <laughs> yeah. but I do try and wear earth tone shirts. It doesn't have to be camo, but just a, a green, tan, something that blends in. In Patagonia, I wear a lot of blues because all I see is the sun so, and the sky. Any, any other questions? I couldn't have done that good of a job. Kevin, thanks very much. <laughs>